Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Omega Metroid Podcast. My name is Andy Spateri, joined, as always, by Dakota Lasky. The Rapture, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, Andy. It's been a little bit, and obviously a lot's happened since the last time we've talked, but I'm ready to get back into talking about what we love to talk about the most, which obviously is Metroid. So, yeah, I'm feeling good, man. Absolutely. So I guess kind of behind the scenes, full disclosure for uh, the people that have been listening so far, we recorded the initial batch of episodes all at once because we wanted to have uh, some content just like ready to go. So Dak and I have uh, are finally sitting down together now a couple weeks after that's been done. And we've actually made the decision that we're not going to do that anymore. We, it was just uh, we wanted to be current. Mm-hmm. And so we're just going to set up a, a time every week to, to do the show. Um, Because quite frankly, with everything going on in the world, it's been a heavy few weeks. uh, We were just chatting and it's like, man, we need the we need the escape of of not only, you know, you guys listen to the Metroid show, but for us that the escape is recording the Metroid show. So we kind of front loaded that experience for ourselves and trickled it out. But like, I think that it's going to work out a lot better just, uh, you know, carving out this little slice of time to talk something that we absolutely love, which, as Dak said, is the Metroid series. So um, we're hoping that we could be a, a bright light in these dark times to uh, all of our listeners. And thank you to everyone that downloaded uh, the first batch of episodes. Uh, you know, I, I think I've said it a million times, but I'll say it again. Thanks to Ryan and the team over at Metroid Database for plugging our show. We really appreciate it. Uh, you could probably look forward to hearing uh, either Ryan or one of his team jump on the show and offer up some of their hot Metroid takes in the near future. But um, that being said... I guess uh, we got some ground to cover, Dax, so let's get into uh, the show today. Yeah, man, I'm excited. You know, like you said, we kind of front-loaded things a little bit. That first week or or two of recording was great. Like, we talked, like, I mean, we probably sat down and talked, like, three, four hours of Metroid in, like, a week or more. It was awesome, but then, yeah, haven't had any in a little bit. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is really applicable to the situation we're in now today. Of course, a lot of people affected by the spread of coronavirus, so a lot of people have been self-isolating quarantining i myself am from new york city so i'm in like the the epicenter of all that's going down and we were talking about this previous to recording this about what topics we wanted to do we thought why don't we talk about what would it be like if there's a metroid movie or a tv show like what would our like ideal movie or tv show for a metroid series b what would we want to watch right now if we're quarantining we're at home we're on netflix we're on hulu and we could be watching some metroid what would we want to be watching so we thought that'd be a cool thing to talk about Absolutely. Um, I just finished Castlevania, which I'm a big fan Ooh. of. And that, uh, man, just watching that is just like, God, uh, if only we could get like a Metroid or a Zelda or a, a something of this caliber, uh, that, that would just be like so unbelievable. So yeah, we're going to dive all into a Metroid movie, TV series, whatever you want to call it, a live action adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get there, actually, we have a few notes that we should probably touch on. Oh, absolutely. Really quickly, there was a Nintendo Direct Mini that just happened. And my big takeaway from the Nintendo Direct Mini is like, well, I can see why they called it a Mini. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> nothing really of note or of consequence happened. There was no Metroid Prime 4 news, obviously. No Breath of the Wild 2. No new game announcements that we didn't really know about already. Um, Xenoblade Chronicles coming out, which is cool. Arms coming to Smash, which is like kind of cool. But nothing really that, uh, that, that blew my socks off. Dak, I know that you said you didn't even watch this thing, right? Yeah, I, 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 it was a surprise, so I wasn't expecting it, obviously, and nothing in the direct really made me like, oh, I gotta jump on this and, and start watching it immediately, so it was a little disappointing that there really wasn't any kind of news that would at least pique our interest, not that I was expecting any surprise Metroid news, but um, yeah. any, any kind of news would have been nice. Uh, the Smash uh, stuff, obviously, is not... Uh, maybe it's only obvious if you know like my taste in Smash, but like I'm not a huge Arms guy. I was a little disappointed with Byleth, and so that kind of lowered my expectations for Smash DLC. Uh, coming into this one, I was uh, <laughs> Arms character was not excited about that. So um, you know, it, yeah, that that kind of like capped off a direct that's going to be very probably one of the most uh, forgettable directs of all time. So. Not definitely yeah. a surprise that we didn't see any surprise Metroid news, but a little bit of something would have been nice. Unfortunately, I think we got to wait a little longer, which, of course, I think at this point we're all used to, so it's kind of the same as it goes as usual. You know, I said this on the Champions cast yesterday, but I think it bears repeating. The most um, the most apropos thing about this mini direct was how they announced the ARMS character for Smash. Usually you yes. get that trailer where it's like, it's like, yeah, Springman punches in or whatever. And this one, they're just like, 
yeah, Buddy's coming to Smash eventually. So, like, that was it. And that was pretty much the direct in a nutshell. So nothing nothing really to get too, too excited about. I have some information that I wanted to tell you, Dak, because okay. it's been a little while. Um, in my uh, quarantine here, mm-hmm. my uh, social distancing, I've actually had the opportunity to go ahead and play a couple awesome games, which I can't wait to talk about long form here on the show. Uh, first and foremost, I got Ori and the Will of the Wisps, mm-hmm. which is just an incredible, incredible Metroidvania game. I highly recommend it. Um, had a little bit of technical issues when it launched, but those should be patched up by the time that hopefully you guys are listening to this. Uh, I've really, really loved that game and uh, had a really fun time with it. I know Metro Database is streaming the original Ori in the Blind Forest on Twitch right now. Uh, they're doing a Let's Play of it, so like check that out if you are into Metroidvanias at all. And speaking of Ori and the Will of the Wisps, I finally, for the first time, uh, finished and completed AM2R, which I have to say was awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, no surprise that a lot of people were kind of tight when it became a little limited in availability because it's a really solid game. And definitely, I, it's I, as far as I'm concerned, for like Nintendo fan remakes, is definitely like one of the best ones that's been made. I, I can't even think of anything that comes close. Like, I, uh, I, I won't talk about it too much because we are going to talk about it long form, I'm mm-hmm. sure. But just what a, what a professional awesome game like just really fun and i think that it uh it it really does stand apart from sam's returns but in a in a good way like they're they're their own unique experiences even though they are both kind of the same game so um that was really cool and you know what i uh another game that i have been playing in my quarantine here for the first time as promised metroid prime federation force Ooh. How is it? So How's it going? Um, again, I don't want to get uh, too 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 much into it because we're gonna do a show on it yeah. in uh, in long form. But it's not it's not the best. It's not the worst. <laughs> it's uh, it kind it is what it is. I think that there. I have a lot of thoughts on it from before I even played it, um, and after playing it, I think that um, with a few subtle tweaks, this could have been. Uh, maybe more than it was, and uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that because uh, I, I'm, I, I'll say this. I often compare it in my own head as a Zelda fanboy to The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes. They're both kind of these maligned 3DS games that are offshoots from the from the core of the series. I think that Federation Force is a far better and more complete video game than Triforce Heroes. Yeah, I mean, I always maintain that Federation Force was like a victim of its time. You know, if it really came out in a, a time of Metroid where there are a lot more enjoyable Metroid games coming out and people had their fill of traditional Metroid, Federation Force would have been received a lot better than it was. It just kind of came out after the game that shall not be named and pretty long <laughs> after that, too, you know? So, like, it was not only that it came out after that, but it came out after people waited a while. So. I really think that if it like Metroid Prime Hunters, I think is a game that's is a pretty polarizing game and is criticized a lot. But it came out in a time where people had Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime Two. They had a lot of Metroid. They had you know Samus and Melee. They had this. They had that. They had all these different things that they could fill their you know and satiate their appetite for Metroid and their traditional Metroid, while still getting these different experiences. If Federation Force came out during that time, I think it would have been received very similar way. And I love Hunters, by the way, and I think Federation Force is really not a bad game. But yeah, we'll talk about it more, and I'm I'm interested to hear your full thoughts on it. Yeah, no, that I, that's such, that's such a great point. I think that uh, I I agree 100. percent It was a victim of timing. Uh, it was a victim of a few other things as well, yeah. but the timing certainly didn't help. And I think that we are definitely less forgiving of it because of when it came out but that is for a future episode today we are going to get into uh what we would want to see from a metroid movie or live action tv show and i guess we should really start there like we the original the title of the uh of the episode is what do we want from a metroid movie but in my eyes like making a movie or like a live action series is almost interchangeable to me Hmm. um you might you might have more long form storytelling available to you if you're going the route that like the witcher did where it is a full netflix series of like eight episodes so you have like an eight hour let's say journey instead of perhaps a a two-hour movie or something like that to me i feel like you could achieve um i feel like you could achieve the same goal either way so like 
when I say like a, a live action adaptation movie TV show, I, I think I'd be fine with either one. But do you have a preference as to kind of which treatment a, a hypothetical Metroid live action adaptation would get? Yeah, for me, well, it's actually interesting that you mentioned live action because I wasn't even really I was I was thinking live action, but like, damn, an animated Metroid mo- or movie or TV series would probably bang too. That'd be pretty good. Um, but yeah, let's assume we're doing live action, right? Um, I've always been a fan of going, at least for a lot of sci-fi stuff, going the TV route because it gives you a lot more room to expand on things. But you know, the current Hollywood you know, filming and, and culture here is like you mentioned where the TV shows aren't like necessarily like one-off stories. It's a long eight hour movie, you know, over a course of many episodes. Um, whereas I feel like Metroid would be really good in an episodic nature where it doesn't necessarily have that like eight hour movie feel. It's like individual stories told after, you know, one after another. And that's why I've always wanted the TV series. I've also been afraid of movies because historically video game movies have not, fared very well at the box office they haven't been produced very well in a lot of cases so i don't want to be a, you know stuck in a situation where i get a crappy remake of the original metroid story that i've already heard a billion times i already know how it goes but you know i gotta put it and see it on a movie you know in the movies now and it's a hour and a half movie and it's not received very well and then we never get anything else again that's what i'm afraid of so it's it's a multifaceted answer for me but it's for me i've always gone for the tv route at least for metroid um actually i gotta take i gotta plug something here really quickly if you want to hear a podcast about uh, video game movies and how they're usually terrible i actually co-host a podcast called virtual theater Mm. with uh gooey fame who uh i believe uh i don't know if you met gooey yet or not but um we we cover all sorts of different video game movies so i definitely know what you're talking about where the uh (laughs) the video game movies are suspect at best a lot of the times i think like a few years ago um, and this is why I say they're a TV show and a movie are interchangeable. But I think a few years ago, uh, like a, a TV show would have been considered lesser than making like a full movie. For sure. But I think like now the quality of like all these shows and stuff like that is like the pedigree of both are like kind of on an equal level. And that's more so what I mean when I say like, I don't think that it really, um, I don't think it matters hmm. to me like what you would make that that show on or that movie on, like, I think they're both equally respected medium. Um, I based kind of my, like, what I had in mind around, like, more of a movie format than a TV show format. I think, like, if you leaned into the the hunter aspect of Samus, though, and, like, her bounty hunter aspect, you could absolutely make, like, a pretty cool, like, series, almost like The Mandalorian, where it's, like, you have your monster of the week, and you go and hunt it down, and then mm-hmm. next week you go over, and you have a new challenge, but, like, there's also kind of this overarching plot. Exactly. Um, so I think that that would be cool. I, I, I'll i present you my movie pitch, right. because I think it's, like, more of a contained story, but I would be definitely down with that, too. But, you know, I, again, I think that either way, like, the the prestige is, is definitely on the same level now. Yeah, I agree with that, for sure. And, I, you know, series like Game of Thrones, prior to Season 8, even though, to be honest, oh, I no. mean, well, I mean, to be honest, it's season, only seasons one through four are good. So but that, that's another point. But, um, you know, series like Game of Thrones and other series throughout, like, the 2000s, the 2010s, all shown that, yeah, you can have TV series that are on the same scale, on the same level of quality as a movie and are essentially a movies in and of themselves, you know, so... Um, but I do think like it would be cool to have that kind of monster of the week thing. I always think of like Star Trek would be a really good analogous, not the new Star Trek, not like Discovery or Picard or whatever, but I'm talking about like old Star Trek stuff. And I wasn't really a huge Star Trek fan, but what Star Trek did really good was that you had like these contained stories from episode to episode with, like you said, the overarching, um, things that, and, and Metroid, because it is very, uh, limited in characters, it's limited in you know interactions between other like sentient stuff for the most part i think you could really explore some cool themes that metroid goes into here and there with the games but because they're mostly based on gameplay and not necessarily being like a super complex story in the games with a tv show you can really flesh out samus's character maybe in a not cringy way flesh out a lot of different themes in metroid that um you know don't necessarily have to be like crazy and bombastic in an actiony way they can be told in a really intimate and personal way and these contain stories. Uh, at the same time, a movie can do that as well in like an hour and a half too, and you could have a really great story there. Honestly, either one would be really cool. Um, 
but I do think, yeah, like, well, because both movies and TV shows nowadays are shot very similarly and, like, budgeted very similarly, like, you kind of can't go wrong with either one, um, except, you know, with a video game movie, again, just afraid of that. <laughs> it's bad once and you don't see it anymore. I think a big thing, though, about having a TV series for Metroid is we always want Metroid, like, as fans, we know it's not, like, the biggest franchise and, like, it would be great if it was more popular and more fans grew, you know, attach themselves to the IP. With a TV series, you kind of keep it in, the, like, the current events and, like, in the popular culture and recent events more often, right? You constantly have, like, a new season come out, new episodes come out, whatever it is. Whereas a movie, it comes out once, and if it hits, you know, you'll have, have a sequel hopefully in a year, year or two, whatever. But if it doesn't hit, then you really don't have that hold on popular culture, which would be really cool f to see a lot of Metroid fans stick on a new property in Metroid for a long period of time. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. And it also makes me think the advantage of a show is that you can check out shows like presumably everyone will have Netflix or like a lot of people will have a streaming device where this is on. So like you you've already paid your money. You can check out episode one if you want for free. And, you know, if you're not into it, then you can move on. Mm -hmm. But if you're unsure, you can at least like watch it for free. That first episode where like you know, going to a movie obviously requires a little bit more of a commitment. You you got to pay your ticket, right. go to the actual movie theater, and, uh, you know, once you're in, you're in. So, yeah, I, I think that that is a good point. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about maybe how we'll do this. Is Maybe we'll talk about, like, what kind of style a movie mm -hmm. or an adaptation. Let's just call it an adaptation, actually. An adaptation, um, it would be, and, like, what are some other kind of movies or shows or whatever that you would take inspiration from stylistically wise, maybe a few subtle changes that we would make in order to make the transition from video game to, um, to the silver screen actually work. Right. And then, uh, we'll talk maybe plot point, but I wanted to start out with like the kind of style of movie that I envision working for a Metroid movie. And it's kind of an amalgamation of a few different movies here, but the uh, the first thing that comes to my mind immediately when I think of like what I would want to see from a Metroid movie on screen is something akin to Blade Runner 2049 or like Mad Max where like mm. it's very colorful, it's very stylized and like uh, there's not a ton of dialogue but the dialogue that there is is important dialogue and it's uh, the really like the picture speaks louder than a lot of the dialogue ever could. I really envisioned that working for a Metroid movie because like, I think that I think while it's inescapable that you're going to have to have characters talk in this movie, I think what you really want to get across from the, uh, from the Metroid series to the silver screen is like the atmosphere and the sense of um, I, like just the, the sense and the feelings that you get when you, when you explore all the different planets. And I think like, the, the colors of those two movies, Blade Runner, Mad Max, I think really set up a good job and tell a story in those movies. And I think that that is very important. And to have it like stylized like that, I think would be important as well to kind of convey like, because you almost want the planet that Samus is on, whatever planet that is, to be its own character. And I think that having that same kind of visual art style is like important in getting that across. Oh, that's such a good point. I love that. Every planet is its own character. Yes, I 100% agree with that. I do think that I would be afraid that Metroid would fall into that kind of like generic sci-fi like um, presentation that you kind of get. Um, I think a good example of that is Expanse. If I don't know if you've watched Expanse on, on Amazon, which I like. I, it's a very good show, I think. And so I recommend it if you're a big fan of like sci-fi shows. Um, and it has a lot of there elements. There you go. I just like, finished Castlevania. I need a new show to watch. Yeah, so I definitely recommend Expanse. It has a lot of like stuff that really makes it unique in a show where it, it deals a lot with like real physics and like how it feels to be on a ship traveling through space and like dealing with G forces and stuff like that. But it does have a kind of, you know, kind of like tropey sci fi, uh, you know, presentation to it, like the characters and the conflict between like Mars and, and Earth and all that kind of stuff, which is like. The storytelling and all that's fine, but I wouldn't want Metroid to kind of fall into that. I, whereas you mentioned Mad Max, which I think would be a great inspiration for Metroid because, yes, it does have that stylistic kind of in-your-face thing, which could be used for certain planets or certain enemies that Samus, uh, you know, comes across. Whereas you could have different styles in other planets, you know, it might be a little less aggressive on a frozen planet that 
Samus, you know, runs up on where she ends up on this crazy hot, like, lava planet or something, fighting some crazy lava monster. It's going to be a little more, <laughs> and you know, crazy like that. I think that's such a good idea and kind of strays from the norm, whereas I would be afraid it would kind of fall into that generic, like, oh, we have a character in armor. They're going to go and do the generic sci-fi stuff, which because people, Metroid isn't a big series. A lot of people don't really necessarily understand a lot of the niche stuff that makes Metroid good, and thus it could kind of get you know, lost in the translation from the source material to the adaptation. So yeah, I think a stylized approach would be great. And I, and I want to ask you a question because you bring up Mad Max, who would you want to star like, and be like the leading person of a Metroid thing? Because I have an answer for it and you brought up Mad Max. So it almost kind of hints at mine. So. Like stars in who plays Samus or yeah. stars in like Who's, the antagonist who, 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 who plays, who would play Samus? Cause that's the, I feel like that's the question people want to know. Right. Okay, well, I was, I was going to save that for, for later, but we can jump into that now. I, I, I want to um, know your answer, man, because you were teasing me before this episode. Yeah, so <laughs> I only picked one actress. And I guess, like, we should also say that uh, there's a lot of, like, scuttlebutt online. I think Brie Larson said mm-hmm. about a month ago that she would love to play Samus in an adaptation. And I actually, like, I don't think that that would be the worst. I think okay. that, um, like, the Captain Marvel movies were kind of, like, maligned a little unfairly i don't think that those were great movies but i don't necessarily think that like brie larson was the problem with them Mm -hmm. um so i actually like i don't think that would be the worst but here is my pick for who i would have play samus and this is uh i might butcher her name here but i'm gonna try anyways kiernan shipka okay i don't even know who that is (laughs) so for anybody unfamiliar with that name she plays Sally Draper in Mad Men, and I believe she pra- she plays Sabrina in the new um, oh, okay. in the new Sabrina and whatever whatever the new show is called. Um, I I just think that she was like a really really like well rounded actress. She's not like she's not like ingrained in a particular role, if that makes sense. Like it, when you see her, you wouldn't immediately think like, oh yeah, she's so and so from. Like, you know when you see a character from The Office and you're like, oh, yeah, it's Jim from The Office. Right. Um, like, she doesn't have that. I think that her, like, you could see her acting chops really, really grow on Mad Men. She started out there as a kid and then was kind of a teenager when it ended. Um, the Sabrina show, I haven't watched it, but it looks pretty dark and twisted. I think that she has, like, the look of Samus. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, she, uh, maybe it's just because I was fond of her character in Mad Men, but that was kind of the one that when we were thinking about this, I instantly was like, okay, I could see her as Samus. The only thing really that maybe would um, go against or be a knock against her is that I think that she's still pretty young. Yeah. uh, Her Wikipedia says she's 20, which is, you know, another kind of question is when would this, which I think we can go into another part, but like, when would this story take place? Because obviously if she's 20, the implication there is that it might be a story that might take place earlier in the Metroid timeline. Um, right and and i have kind of a, the like the rough right a rough outline of a plot which we'll get to in a bit but yeah um i i think that you could really like you could make it work i think i think no matter which actress you are getting to play samus you can kind of play around with it and make it work no matter what but um i mean the the fact that she's young too would be kind of good because then it's like okay well like now we we know that we have her for you know, X amount of seasons or X amount of movies. Like right. this, this character is all in where like, you don't really have to worry about them aging out kind of like, uh, like a Robert Downey Jr. In Iron Man. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and even then, like he still had like a ton of movies under his belt, but yeah, you kind of have to, you can't have him be Iron Man forever. I mean, that's, I guess nowadays uh, with technology, you kind of could just, <laughs> just like de uh, Yeah, him, pretty much. You know, like, and, um, what was the, the new, um, mob movie that came out with uh oh god it was like five hours long yeah but everyone um, in it was like de-aged yeah uh i think i blocked it from my memory actually. the, I- the, the irishman, irishman that's what it was yeah, yeah. Everyone <laughs> just just de just de-age whoever you have as samus forever um um who who are you thinking to play samus well you brought up mad max so my pick has been Charlize theron since i saw that movie i thought she'd be so good as as samus I was like, wow, she's such a badass in this movie. Like, this is literally like just literally do what she has in Mad- does in Mad Max, and but in a power armor, you know. She's really yeah. like, she's like, I think she like really embodies like who Samus is as a character. To me, it was like a, literally like someone that is gonna take a lot to put down is has a mission, gonna 
execute that mission and make it happen. And, you know, there's no BS. Um, and is a more like, as far as I'm concerned with Metroid, a lot of my favorite, you know, like Metroid Fusion, for example, is one of, is one of my favorite Metroid games. And that's where she's at her chronologically oldest, right, in, in Metroid. Um, whereas like Metroid Prime, I guess, technically is my other favorite. And that's towards the beginning. But still, like, she's an adult in those situations. Whereas like, if I'm looking at an actress like Kieran and Shipka, that like says like that might be an earlier metroid story it might be like federation time or like before she's a hunter or like very early in her career whatever it is whereas like i'd be more interested in a story that takes place when she's already more experienced so or even takes place after fusion whatever it is whereas i so i feel like charlie's theron would fit that bill great actress I think they're both great actresses actually but I, that she's been my pick especially since mad max but um yeah so that's who i would go with yeah that's a great pick i think that she uh charlize theron is is an incredible actress Mm -hmm. and like actually so the the movie that popped into my head as soon as you said that was atomic blonde and like how much ass she kicked in that movie so like i I feel like that would be um a natural for me Like, like she's got the acting chops too to pull that off like i think like i think ultimately not that it doesn't matter who plays Samus, but I think if you nail the tone and you nail the the script, then like whoever does play Samus is going to have a lot easier time kind of conveying that. So like, um, I'm, I'm kind of more interested in like the setup to get to where we, you know, where we actually end up being like, okay, like we have a vision for what the show is going to be. Now let's cast the, the actresses and stuff like that. For sure. Um, but I think the Charlie Theron would be a, a great pick. I want to go back. Yeah, yeah. Let's to go back to what we were talking about. So, like the tone, the all of that. Like, tell me more about how you're feeling about it. So, I I have, I don't know if it's even a hot take, but like just a personal preference to me is like you know when you're playing Metroid and you're you're going deep into whatever. Like, let's say you're playing Prime and you're going deep into uh, the Space Pirates layer, and you finally see the Metroids. Like, and you've never seen them in the game yet, and you see the Metroids, or, like, you're playing Fusion, and you're just like, oh, my God, it's a Metroid. And you kind of get that, like, that tinge of fear down your down your back, and it's like, God, like, they're finally here because they've built up these these creatures, or maybe it's even the player that's built up these creatures as, like, these mean killing machines. So, like, I always think that Metroid works really, really well when it's, like, that sci-fi, but also, like, kind of got that horror vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Not, like, not, like, horror in an over-the-top way, but, like, dread. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, um, and this, this probably sounds like super, super obvious of a analogy to make, but like, I think that alien, like the mm-hmm. original movie alien really nailed that where it's like, it was sci-fi, but it was also like, like when they're exploring the planet and they originally find the egg, you're just like, something could go wrong at any moment here. And I feel like something's about to. And I think that that is kind of a cool vibe that a Metroid movie to me would try to invoke like kind of that that sense of dread hanging over you like like okay things are maybe fine now but they're not gonna stay fine and i think if you mix that kind of vibe with like you know some eventual awesome fights that you could have in your movie that it would be a really good recipe to to cook up something cool yeah and that's the thing when you talk about like what do you want from metroid movie because obviously metroid is very much directly inspired by movies that were already existing so you know, we try to think of like what the what could a Metroid movie do that essentially makes it not Alien, right? Where it's gonna be a lot like Alien because that's what it is essentially. Um, right. I do think like one thing that sets Metroid and Alien apart, though, is that Samus is a character we know that is very c- capable of a lot, right? Like she isn't a regular human; she's not armed with regular human armament. So for something to be scary for her, to be a threat to her means that it has to be like it would be something that's absolutely crazily insanely scary and i think that's where horror would come where we go into like an area where she's like so into like a crazy like area like like for example in the space pirate labs where you're you're so deep in like this lab without like being able to see right and so like that's pretty that's why it's scary because when you know like wow even samus can't like uh, necessarily observe what's about to happen here you know that it's going to be a big threat I think that's where the horror would be great. And I don't want to necessarily be like getting jump scares right from Metro. I think the horror comes like, wow, like she's uncovering some like ancient evil that's bigger than she really thinks or, or you know, uncovers a, a monster that's bigger than she actually thinks it is. Right. I think that's a hundred percent. Those agree. are the situations yeah. I want to see from Metro, not necessarily jump scares or, oh, my God, spooky monster. But Samus is scared because she's overcoming some 10,000 year old you know, artifact or something that like is going to. Whatever it is, uh, create an enemy that makes her scared, 
that's going to make us even more scared in the situation. And I want to see situations like that. And I think Metroid could do that really well. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more like that. And that's kind of what I meant when like, not a typical horror, like yeah. this thing just jumped out of the dark exactly. and like kind of those, those cheap pops or whatever. Like those, the, let's just, let's just keep those on the side, but let's build up that sense of tension. That sense of dread, I think is, is a cool exactly. way to dread is like the perfect word for it. Not just like horror, but like dread, yeah. like existential or like the fear of the unknown or the fear of like, you're so much like in part of something that's so much larger than you. Um, you know, which I think is a, t- a theme we see a lot in Metroid, right? Where Samus ends up in a situation that is pretty, you know, for the most part, run of the mill, right? A common SOS signal from Frigate Orphean, or she's escorting some scientists in SR388, whatever it is, or some other planet, and it's not a big deal, and she finds some frog thing attacking her, right? It's usually like a small situation that gets like blown up into this crazy scale that she has to deal with. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I really want to, like, see something like that where we get, like, a movie or a show where she, like, uncovers something we haven't seen before in Metroid. And that, like, fear of the unknown of, like, oh, man, like, this is something that could be, like, really big, a huge threat for her. And that's what's, like, exciting about it. Yeah, and I agree. And actually, you said something kind of cool, too, which is, like, it takes a lot to um, kind of, pos- like, pose a threat to Samus because she's such a capable warrior, which I think is actually, like kind of an important kind of an important factor in into kind of getting that sense of dread Mm -hmm. so with that in mind i had a pitch for you actually about what my like the bare bones plot would be but before i get there um i do want to talk really quickly about how the characters themselves would actually talk i think that um so obviously in a metroid movie or adaptation or whatever you're you're gonna have samus and i think that you absolutely have to have ridley as well in some form or fashion you know i'm gonna say yes to some ridley of course so my question is, and I was I was kind of going back and forth on this because I wasn't sure which would be more effective, but um, obviously we know that we know that Samus is going to have to talk, and like I said earlier, I'm kind of basing my what like my dream Metroid movie in my head off of like a Blade Runner where like Ryan Gosling doesn't talk that much, but when he does, it's very effective, and I and I feel like Samus should fall into that category, but what I was kind of going back and forth on was like, okay, should Ridley talk? Because I feel like you need an antagonist in order to, like, sell kind of the the plot or something. So, like, uh, I think that in one hand, like, if Ridley did talk, it makes him seem like this more intelligent monster, which can be more scary. But on the other hand, it's like, it's like sometimes it's equally just as scary. Like, if you have this force of nature, which is Ridley, kind of stalking you throughout the movie, like almost like the like the xenomorph in Alien. Now that I think about it, actually. Um, you just have this thing that's after you this entire movie and you're trying to get away from it. So like, I don't know. What, what do you think? Would you, would you be down for like more of a character Ridley or like more of a force of nature Ridley? Well, I'm, for me, I definitely think it has to be a mix. Whereas he, you know, you limit how much he talks, you know, he doesn't talk a lot. He's not a character where you're cutting to a scene where he's talking to his henchmen, you know, like some other space pirates. I do think that if you had a show, I would, I would like to see him talk, but a very, very, very little, less than Samus too, because for the most part, yeah, he should be that force of nature threat where he's stalking. His threat is, you know, he's this crazy cunning beast that's going to find you but when he does get in really close and you are fighting him tooth and nail or he corners you and then he speaks i think that's where it kind of like evolve, you know um uh, it makes it evolve from just like this you know the kind of like base like xenomorph situation where you have the the, the alien that's stalking you and you have ridley who's like one step further where he's stalking you as well he is the same kind of alien beast but when you get really close there's more to it than that and he's gonna pick at you emotionally um, which I think is also, and, and using his Here's... cunning more than just the average beast would, which I think is what makes a lot of his character interesting to me. So I do, I would like to see him talk again, very, very, very little. And it's, it would, I'm not sure how they would even do it. I don't know if it would be good, but I'd like to see them try. I, I think if they kind of didn't have him talk, it would be a missed opportunity. Here's something I just thought of in kind of a weird analogy, but like maybe how I would present Ridley in a Metroid movie, similar to Darth Maul from star wars episode Ooh. one like okay. maul didn't really talk much but he was such an imposing physical presence and like he was after the jedi and like when they finally did have their confrontation at the end it was like this wicked fight but like he also like he was able to sell a lot with his um with his face with his facials and like his expressions and stuff like that it's so, like ridley kind of the same thing where like 
he can talk, he is a character, but, like, he's also, kind of like you said, it's a mix. It's, like, this character, but also this force of nature that is just chasing Samus, and uh, eventually they have their showdown. Yeah, um, I think... Who do you, like, who do you imagine is the antagonist of a, of a Metro movie? Like, is it Ridley, or is it, like, just generic space pirates, or, like... What's your kind of idea? Well, uh, before we go into that real quick, because I think how you how you spoke on that is something that, you know, I was thinking, like, how would Ridley necessarily be, like, presented? You mentioned Darth Maul, which I think is interesting, because Ridley is essentially the Darth Vader of Metroid. You know, he's the he's the boots-on-the-ground general, right? Um, mm-hmm. That leads the antagonist of Force, because, I mean, Mother Brain can't move around. Dark Samus is doing, you know, sucking some phase in somewhere, or whatever it is, right? Um, X doing whatever. So... For, for when you bring up Darth Maul, like, well, he's kind of like Darth Vader, but I would love to see like a mix of like Darth Vader and Gravemind from Halo, where you have a character, okay. a character that is actively pursuing you, moves around, and can engage with you both physically and communicate with you. But when they do speak, it's limited. It's very like when you, I mean, the cutscenes that you have in like Halo Two, for example, with Gravemind, right? It's very like just so booming and like the the absolute like scale and like weight of everything he says is so crazy i wouldn't like darth maul nothing he says is ever like important right i can't imagine i can't think of a single line darth maul says right like can you think of one from the prequels i can't think of one like when i'm I'm thinking of a character who like every line is extremely important extremely pronounced like very deep has a ton of weight on it because i think ridley is more than just kind of this like bad guy that's just the fodder for you know another character right um, which mm-hmm. can leads into like who do you think the protagonist should be? That being said, I don't think Ridley should be the main protagonist because I don't think that's the role he fills. You know, when I, he fills like that, the other uh, the inner conflict. He's the the constant chase, the constant test the world the universe has for Samus that she can't avoid. It's the inter, you know that constant like even though it's presented in an external way, it's really tests a lot of her internal limits. How you know how many times can she face off against the same person? I mean, we've seen in many Metroid games where she's had different reactions to how she's faced Ridley, despite seeing her, seeing him previously. But whatever, you know. So like, there's a lot of like internal stuff that goes on in their relationship, where he also does fill this kind of force of nature thing, which again also doesn't really necessarily make him like a character I would make like the main antagonist of the story. He's the character that's like the continued threat. That constantly presents new issues for Samus internally as well as externally. Whereas you have another character, you know, whereas, uh, you know, in the Metroid games you have, like, Mother Brain, you have Dark Samus, you have the X, etc., who are really leading the show. They're really the, the main threat. Ridley kind of is that existential threat, the, the secondary thing. And that's the role he fills, and I think that's a great role. Whereas, like, you know, just like in Star Wars, Darth Vader is not the the end all antagonist right even though you would say like who's really the most important antagonist of star wars well it's, it's darth vader right he's the biggest test for luke skywalker uh you know internally and all of that whereas of course the the main conflict we're looking for is him against the emperor right darth mm-hmm. vader is really the one who is the engine of the story in terms of an antagonistic force and i think that's the same role that ridley faces he's not the emperor but he's darth vader who's i would argue the most important so I don't know who the main antagonist would be now that I've said that. I don't know because I, I, that's such a hard question. I feel like it would have to be a, yeah. unique, a unique character to the series uh, that's not Ridley, I guess, or Force. I don't know. I, I feel like like I feel like he'd want it to be kind of the the leader of the Space Pirates. And like you said, like Ridley's more more the Vader. So like in Finding the Sidious, I, I don't think that Mother Brain, as is, works as a villain no. on TV. No. Um, I do actually think, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, that perhaps you could borrow from the Metroid Other M playbook, though, and make, like, a a humanoid version of Mother Brain, kind of like an MB, and have like at least, like, a human-formed version of Mother Brain or, like, a human general uh, or like a humanoid general kind of leading the space pirates, even if it's not necessarily human itself. Um, that that could potentially work, I think, if you uh, if you did that properly. Obviously, you'd handle it with a little bit more finesse than uh, I, <laughs> than other. Well, that's if the space pirates there. are even like the main threat too. You know, where you know, like yeah. they may not even be that. And I think that's like how I would look at it. Whereas or that's how I would look at it. The story wouldn't necessarily be Samus versus the space pirates. The space pirates might be involved. Because they're pirates, you know, they're always trying to steal stuff. So they're, they might not be necessarily the the direct, like, 
antagonist, but just like Ridley might not necessarily be the direct like threat, but he is a threat because he is actively pursuing Samus, pursuing whatever it is gains for the space pirates right at the time again it really comes right. down to like what the scenario is where this takes place in the timeline does it takes place in the timeline is it its own thing is it canon is it not all that kind of stuff i think that really also kind of makes a big difference like where exactly does this take place on the timeline or at all um you know for it to make sense in terms of the story so I think that my answer to that question is this doesn't take place in the Metroid timeline as we know it at all. Okay. And I think that that's the way that it has to be um, for an adaptation. Like I'll use Castlevania again as a, as a good reference. Like we know that that Netflix uh, series uh, is, is kind of a loose adaptation of Rondo of blood, symphony of the night and curse of darkness, but like it's its own thing. So like it takes inspiration from all those games, but like it's making its own timeline, which I feel like is really if you if you don't do that, if there's a Metroid movie that's trying to adhere to what's already happened in the timeline, like there's just so many handicaps that it has. So I feel like it has to exist kind of on its own and as its own entity in order to truly succeed um, and, and have that freedom. So I have, again, I have a pitch for you, but I will say a couple other things that I would um, that I would do just to kind of again let my Metroid movie, my hypothetical Metroid movie be a little bit more free Mm -hmm. is I think that you do have to give up certain things that the Metroid franchise is known for. Um, I I think that you like, obviously a a big part of the Metroid franchise is collecting items, power ups that let you get, um, you know, that let you progress further and further. I think that that probably has to go as we know it in a potential metroid tv show or movie or whatever Hmm. i think that samus starts with her power-ups and like you can maybe give her a new suit somewhere along your adventure if your if your plot dictates that but like i just think that like finding the morph ball or find or not the morph ball i guess because you could include that but like finding a new beam or finding x revisor or whatever like that's it's not necessarily essential to what we need to tell in a story of a Metro movie. So I think I would leave that at the table and just like you have Samus, she has the powers that she has and that's what we're working with for the duration of our movie. And I think that another thing that I would leave on the table as well is the evolutions of the Metroids. I think that like, it's obviously important. I think that you have Metroids themselves in a Metroid movie, but I think that if you show their evolutions, that that would be confusing, especially to newcomers that aren't familiar with Metroid. So you have your Metroids, they are what they are, and that's kind of that. Maybe you can get away with having a queen Metroid, but that's really, like, that's it. Um, I don't know. Does that sound kind of sacrilegious to you? Hmm. I mean, I don't not necessarily sacrilegious, but I do disagree on both counts. Um, yeah, I would. I definitely disagree, uh, especially... The, the second point, not so much, but especially the first point. I think a big part of what makes Metroid great for me is that you start with a character who, well, the, you know, some games she starts out strong, then she gets weak, start gets strong again. But, like, essentially a character who is strong has potential to get strong. But a lot of the, the, the at least for me, the enjoyment is becoming stronger, getting those power-ups. And I think watching a character who slowly but surely, like, upgrades their arsenal is, is a fun thing to watch. Uh, and that's again why I've wanted like a TV series because you can do that over the course of a TV series. You can put in these different parts of you know the story where she goes to get this thing or abstract or abs- uh, uh, sorry wow um, you know extract something from a complex or facility that upgrades her armory or whatever it is. Um, I think that would be really cool and, and stays in line with what Metroid's all about. And you can tell stories on the way there. Obviously, you have the MacGuffin of she's going to get something to upgrade her arsenal she's doing something that could potentially upgrade you know her capabilities but that's not the main point of it it's like the 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 journey to the destination right like the challenges on the way and like how she changes as a character and then you have the you know the end goal of her getting that upgrade or getting to this place or whatever it is and that keeps things simple storytelling wise and makes a little you know clear you know what she's going for we always know what she's going for she's looking to get stronger and get here and get there and acquire this and acquire that which is what metroid's about so I think that would be really cool. And then you, if you don't have that stuff, you kind of miss out on those cool scenes where she defeats someone, something strong, and she gets a really sick upgrade, and now she starts using that upgrade to unlock a new place she couldn't get to before that could be hinted at earlier in the movie or in the TV series. Um, I think you kind of lose a lot if you don't have that. Uh, and I would love to see what kind of cool upgrades 
or beams or whatever it is that the writers could come up with for, for Samus. And on the second point, for the Metroids, uh, yeah, I think if you just had, like, base Metroids, it probably wouldn't be the, the worst thing. But I think you're missing an opportunity to kind of flesh out the world a little more. I think stuff where showing the life cycle of the Metroid and would really kind of sell the uh, the threat that the Metroids are, showing that they're not just these, you know, energy-sucking, floaty jelly sacks, right? Like, they grow into these actual big monsters that are huge threats and generate even more Metroids or whatever it is, right? Um, I think that'll really sell the, the threat of what Metroids are rather than just being told, yeah, they're really bad, uh, this is the only form they come in, though, but they're really bad, trust me, um, which I feel like would probably end up being the case. If you really show the life cycle, that kind of speaks for itself. They're like, oh, this isn't just like these, you know, little creatures that, you know, you can freeze midair and, yeah, they'll, you know, take out regular humans, but Samus can deal with them. Um, the, the big stuff is really kind of the meat and potatoes. We kind of see the evolution. It adds an opportunity to talk about lore a little more, gives a little more depth to the world. So I would personally keep those things, but that's just me. See, I kind of go the other way, actually, because if you if you present the Metroids in their base form, um, and the game kind of does this as well, they present Metroids as, like, they're almost, like, they're not inherently evil creatures. They're no. just captured by the space pirates and being used for evil purposes. Right. We're like, um, and I think that you could present that in the movie as well if you just had the base form where, like, these creatures aren't necessarily evil. They can do good things, um, and you could eventually down the line introduce the X, but like, I feel like when you when you show their evolution forms, they just like they just look like generic monsters, and you're like, okay, well these are just monsters that need to be defeated. Like these are evil creatures, blah blah blah. Hmm. Um, so that that's my rationale behind that. Okay. I, I, like, I just think the items, it sounds good on paper, but I don't know really how you could make it work for a movie or a TV show and not just have it be old. I think that you could use the MacGuffin maybe once or twice of like. Of like, yeah, okay, we need to venture here and we need to get this power suit so that we can escape through somewhere here. Or like, we need to get this beam so that we can take down the uh, the Space Pirates reactor. But like, I, I just think that like, if you're if you're on like your eighth, like, okay, yeah, now we need to get this so that we can go here. It's just like, it's kind of the same old, same old. So like, I think you can do it in a very limited capacity, which is mm -hmm. kind of why I suggest leaving that at the door but i mean as with everything like if it's done properly it can be it can be good right yeah i mean um, i like to look at fusion when i think of that right like fusion kind of changed yeah. it up where it was sam she had to go to like a download station to download this upgrade and she was like you know kind of in a conflict with the federation to get these like different downloads for all her upgrades or she had to absorb it from an x which kind of like put little twists on it so yeah, i think they could they could change up yeah obviously if if, you know, we have eight different episodes of Samus going to this planet and this planet to get a beam eight times in a row, that'll probably be boring, sure. But um, I think they could change it up and make it so it's not necessarily the same thing over and over again and, and adding some conflict. And it's not just I need to go to point A to accomplish thing B. It's more like <clears throat> this is the situation. We, I want to see Samus kind of like come up with a plan to figure out how she's going to complete her objective. And along the way, maybe she figures out she needs to do this to become stronger. Or she finds about, out about a thing she didn't know existed at the time. And she can like, oh, I'm going to take this detour, which could have its own repercussions of doing so, etc. I think when you add that element, it kind of it, it makes things a little clearer for the audience because they know what she's always pursuing. But at the same time, it, it, you can kind of put little twists on it on that trope to make it a little different. And I think that'd be cool because Metroid is known for that generic. You go to point A, you grab thing, you complete thing B or whatever it is you put a little twist on that on that trope that Metroid's known for it'd be a nice little evolution of it I think again if you if you get rid of that or you don't do it enough if you do it once and twice I feel like it kind of just is like uh, here's a reference to what makes Metroid Metroid but we're not going to do it not necessarily entirely Metroid what makes Metroid Metroid but you know that's that's a big part of Metroid at least to me and they did it like once or twice they had like one episode where like Samus goes and gets the morph ball bombs or whatever and like winks at the camera or something like that all right we got a morph ball bomb we she picked up an upgrade and then doesn't do it again i'd be like oh okay where you know <laughs> this isn't really metroid to me <laughs> and then and in that kind of department but i guess i'll let it slide i don't know i think it would be i, I, I just think that like if you if you handcuff a movie to doing things that a game does like you're you know you have your strengths on uh, a video game genre or not genre but like platform you have your strengths on a movie and if you handcuff your movie to like do everything that the the video game does 
like that that's a lot that's a big reason why i think a lot of video game movies have struggled is because they're not free to kind of do their own thing hmm. um wait, are, are, but wait I mean, we, are you gonna move on after you say that i, I yeah because oh, i gotta I, I, before we do i actually i think that's the opposite i think because they're doing different things we lose what makes the original source material good you know they kind of drop what the original what makes all the fans like the original source material to change it to appease to more people and then you get this watered down version of the actual source material that people don't end up liking but they interpret it as a, a direct adaptation of the source material and if you lose that kind of thing like i don't think you're kind of locking it you're you're you, what you want to do is kind of emphasize what makes those series good and if you get ri- drop that element entirely, I don't think you're necessarily presenting the source material or an adaptation of it. You're presenting like a, a modified version to appease a different audience, and they're therefore not a- actually working with the original source material anymore. I don't know, but that's. I think we could talk more about that. But uh, let's move on. We we could. I guess. I guess in closing, like yeah. to me, like the tone of Metroid is what really matters, mm-hmm. and the atmosphere of what Metroid is what really matters. Like if those translate. And the character of Samus translates into like that that strong badass that we know her to be. Mm-hmm. Then we're gonna be okay. And I like, agree with that. So I think that's the most important thing. Here's yeah. here's kind of my idea because in my mind, it's speaking of the tone and the atmosphere. The biggest challenge that a Metroid movie has is like, who does Samus talk to? Because in on one hand, like it's so important that we get that sense of isolation, dread, danger, and, uh, and everything that comes with it of Samus on this alien planet. But like, on the other hand, like you can't just have a movie of just Samus not talking to anybody. So like, this was my kind of bare bones plot for a Metroid movie. And this is my pitch. And I, it's a rough draft. Okay. So hear me out, but here we go. Dak films. (laughs) What's your elevator pitch to get this movie made? Come on. So my elevator pitch is this. The Galactic Federation asks Samus to go and infiltrate an alien planet that is a known space pirate stronghold. Um, And they're asking her to go and extract something. They don't say what. So Samus goes there and uh, you can have kind of your scenes of like her by herself. I don't want any of those cheesy, like Samus is talking to someone via comm link in her visor or whatever. I just think those are lame. I think that's a lame trope and I don't want that in my Metroid movie. So what what I do want instead is like, Samus is going into this planet. We can have our sense of dread. Maybe we can have a little bit where there is no talking in the in the action and the, the visuals can really sell it. She'll battle some space pirates. We can have a huge battle scene. And we eventually get to the point where like we find what Samus is extracting and it's actually a person. And in my head, I was just like, make it someone vulnerable to enhance that sense of dread. So like maybe it's like a little girl or maybe it's a little uh, like a kid or like something. I don't know. Um, it doesn't really matter. And we can make up a reason why this this little kid is important. Maybe their blood is immune to the X, or like they Metroids don't aren't able to suction up. Like whatever, we can make that plot point whatever it needs to be. But it's important that this let's just call it a little girl is extracted from this planet. So now you have this person who Samus has to escort out. So like you enhance the danger because like obviously Samus is capable, but this person is is kind of a handicap on samus trying to get out of this alien planet you have ridley stalking you this entire time and then you can have this little girl um kind of asking samus questions about her past and about her how she got her abilities and whatever and she can kind of serve as like the audience's like uh proxy and you can you can delve a little bit into samus's past and and whatnot as well i agree we're like i don't want to start out and see like a metroid origin story this would be a completely original story in its own thing but like i i do think that for the general audience you you at least need to like hint at like where samus has come from i think that you hint at the chozo you don't explore them yet save it for a sequel and um that can that can kind of be the crux of your movie right there is like you build up your sense of dread and and whatever and vulnerability by having samus responsible for someone other than herself that's kind of in my head the solution to the problem of like who does samus talk to how does this work um obviously uh obviously not fully fleshed out but uh, what do you think of that hmm <laughs> so, so i mean so you'd have like an independent story you know she's a pretty you know usual setup for a metroid like game i think yeah that'd be a good like introduction or like or like a solid like like representation of metroid 
Um, yeah, I mean that would that would be pretty good. I, you know, it's. I think it kind of is uh, for me. I I don't know. I don't know if I would have her like extract a person, in that kind of way. I mean, personally, my story would be really really different. But um, I think like yours would definitely hit like all the different notes that Metroid needs to hit. I think it would be safe. You know, that's like a safe Metroid movie for me, for sure. Because like, all right, hit me with hit me with your pitch. Let's uh, let's hear what you got. Hmm. See, well. And I, and I don't mean to like offend or anything. If you if you're expecting to get this movie made, you know, Dak Dak Films only has so much money, man. So it has to be the best <laughs> of the best ideas. Um, oh, okay. So I, well, I'm gonna cry myself <laughs> to sleep at night. No, but I it's think okay. this is good. I think no, um, it's... I think the when when I think of like Samus picking up like uh, like a young girl like a planet to like it just screams other M to me. I don't know. Like your premise screams other M where like, she's like protecting like something or like acting. I don't know. Samus doesn't seem like the escort a person type. She seems kind of like, I'm going to call someone to do this or you stay here. I'm going to actually go and destroy the rest of this planet. (laughs) Um, But see, then how do you, how do you combat the, the question of like, who does Samus talk to? She's got to talk to somebody, right? Well, that's why I would love to do a movie that takes place between Metroid prime three and Metroid prime four. Or would be Metroid Prime 4 story before, like, Metroid Prime 4 is announced. Because my biggest issue was, where do you put a movie or a TV show? Let's say we're going with the movie, right? In the in the Metroid timeline. Because I think it should happen in the Metroid timeline. Even though I know you said you'd like it removed. I think it... I don't see why it couldn't happen in the same timeline of, of Metroid oh. games. I think it would be fine. I really have no issue with that. What I think Metroid movies should be doing is filling the gaps, right? The Metroid games should stop doing that and continue the, the, the damn story. And let the movies or the extra stuff fill in the gaps like any other property that does this. Every other property seems to have figured out this solution, right? Where they have the extended expanded universe that fills in the gaps. And the main series or the main property, it continues the story, right? Metroid doesn't want to do that. It wants to do all these inter- interquels and prequels, all that stuff. Leave that to the movies, I think. I would love to see a story that takes place right after Prime 3 that maybe leads into Prime 4 that has the immediate effects of what just happened, right? Because Metroid Prime 3 and Metroid 2 are not really connected. And I guess Metroid Prime 4 would be the connection to those two, but obviously that hadn't been announced for a while. I always want to go into a story where Samus is like dealing with the withdrawals of Phazen. She is having hallucinations, which she could be talking to those hallucinations. She's dealing with, uh, you know, memories from the events of the three Prime series. I think that'd be really cool. Um, I would love us. I would personally love us a, uh, a mission where she's just going out on a mission. It's a very usual, like she's going somewhere to maybe check out a, a Federation outpost that had been overrun by pirates or, or phase infection or whatever it is. She goes back and she's having these flashbacks of like her past battles and she's fighting with this withdrawal. And that's, you know, a, a toxin that was like a disease. And she's like, um, really dealing with all these internal struggles and she might not even face Ridley. Right in like an actual fight but she's like haunted by like images of ridley and images of like her like friends being killed and and all the things that she went through and like her her like further um you know corruption by the phasing whereas it, and it would kind of like fill the gap between maybe metro prime 3 metro prime 4 because i don't know if they'll necessarily take place one after another i have a feeling they might not i think there might be a gap between them um so maybe it could fit in there i think that'd be really cool or something like that um, otherwise, I think you would, I think it would be cool to maybe just continue that story from Fusion. But you mentioned Chozo. I think it would be a good idea to incorporate the Chozo. I think that would be such a good idea to have the Chozo in a Metroid movie because that does kind of open up a lot of opportunities to show off Samus's past. And I'm not the biggest fan of like the proxy character, the obvious proxy character, where like you have this character who is very obviously there to ask the main character questions about their past so we uh, you know learn more about them why not just have her interact with characters from her past right or have her interact with characters that represent her past or whatnot right directly um maybe not necessarily incorporate their ex yet it's hard for me to have like a a a specific metroid pitch because so many different elements really change the setup of the movie where does it take place Mm -hmm. who are you know and because where does it take place that you know completely changes who could be involved at the time right and then, well... Yeah, I just want to clarify. I think having the Chozo would be awesome. Yeah. But I, I would just... I would want to save that, like, tease it, and then save it for, 
like in my head, I'm thinking like this is movie one. Like what's left for movie two? Now, I think, think like, like a deep that, dive though. into Chozo. You don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know if you get that movie two. I think you gotta just you gotta just hit the ground running. Now I think. Now let me tell you the problem with your pitch because it actually sounds pretty cool, but. The, pr- the problem with that is that's a movie strictly for Metroid fans. Yes, like it's yes, just, yes, it is. If, it is a strictly a Metroid fan movie. Yes, you're right. And I and I think that's the that's the inherent difference of what we are pitching here is like I'm pitching a movie for people to get into Metroid. Like if you've never played Metroid before, you can watch this and like, OK, you know what's going on where I think like Metroid fans uh, like that. Your movie sounds sweet to me. But like if you haven't played Metroid Prime 1, 2, 3 you're not going to know what's going on, right? Right. It's so like, it, yes. it's, it's not super accessible. And I think therein lies the, uh, the difference. And I think both are actually like awesome in their own, in their own way. I, th- I think, okay. I, I, yes, I a hundred percent agree with what you're saying in terms of that, like interpretation, but I think it's important to have a movie that caters directly to Metroid fans. I think that's what, I think that's the biggest problem with adaptations for video games is that they don't cater to the hardcore fans because the hardcore fans, that get other people excited for a lot of these properties and continues to keep the, the properties popular or uh, their things being bought, right? It's not the casual Wayfair fans, right, that come in for something, they see it, oh, that's pretty cool, and they leave. When you present a movie that's not really true to the source, you're not going to get people excited to go into that source material because you're presenting them with a watered-down version of the actual thing. If you gave them something that like is really good for a Metroid fan, someone's gonna watch this. They may not understand it, but that's a good thing. They they shouldn't understand it entirely. That's when you tell them, "Hey, go play the Metroid games, and you'll understand it." That's the whole point. But if you give them a movie where they don't have to play the games, why would they ever play the games? They're just not going to. They're just gonna watch the movie and they're gonna go about their lives. If they weren't already playing Metroid games, why would a watered down Metroid movie make them play Metroid games? If you give them a movie that has all these different things that they may not necessarily understand, they're gonna be like, "Damn." I want to go read about yeah, but the why would they games. watch the movie if they've never played Metroid games? Why would you why, yeah, why like do you watch why do you movie? watch any movie if you don't, you know, it's just to experience something new. If you see something cool, the the commercial might be cool or your favorite actress is in it or it's made by your favorite director. There's so many different ways to get someone into a movie with them not necessarily being part of the IP. I mean, there are a lot of movies that I wasn't necessarily I mean, Star, Star Wars is a big uh, example of this. I, you know, had was had no interest in certain people being in it, but then I see a cool movie being made like Rogue One, and Rogue One ties a bunch of stuff into it. I think if you saw like Rogue One and presented this to somebody, you're like, wow, this is a cool movie. Maybe I might go watch the rest of Star Wars. I know people who did, and I think you could do the same thing with Metroid. You present them something that's very heavy on what makes Metroid good, and that in in and of itself makes them excited about what they just saw, and they should go and be hungry for more, not be given something that's watered down, and their belly's full, but it's full of nothing, really. And they're not going to want to go and play the Metroid games. Why would they? They just got a summary Wikipedia movie version of it, right? They should get something that's really concentrated and detailed in a small amount that makes them hungrier for more. And that's when you tell them, oh, you didn't understand this part or this part. You should go play Metroid Prime. You should go play Super Metroid. You should go play Metroid Fusion. And now they're playing the games. If they don't play it after so that, I, I, I think that, like, that's... the point the point of a movie of a video game movie, especially a Metroid movie, because Metroid obviously isn't the biggest series in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that the point of the movie should be inherently to get people interested in the series and to play the games. But I think that like you also need to make it accessible because let's assume that a lot of people, let's say 90%, that's probably being generous of a people that are on Netflix and are just like, Oh yeah. Like I'm going to, I'm going to watch Metroid or whatever. And I'm going to, I'm going to watch her. I'm going to go see the Metroid movie. I think that 90% of them probably aren't going to be familiar with your source material. So it, it does, it does have to be accessible. I just, I don't think that you can present like uh, a movie that's already had like, for lack of a better term, like three movies before it. You know what I mean? Um, like the Witcher is a good example where like you, you start off, you have, you have Geralt of Rivia. He is who he is. They don't spend like a ton of, ton of time on his backstory, but like, enough so that you're not just like okay like what's going on who is everybody you know what i mean true but i want to bring you back to mad max fury road really popular movie you didn't have it it wasn't it had a lot of stuff that was uh, tied to the previous movies but you didn't have to and his situation is tied somewhat but you didn't have to watch the previous like mad max movies to get into it 
and I watched Fury Road without having to have watched any of the previous Mad Max movies. But then I watched Fury Road, and I went back and watched them, and a couple of them are good. Um, but if I was given, you know, not Fury Road, but I was given a watered-down retelling of Mad Max, the first one, I don't know if I would have been as interested to watch the other three movies in the series. Whereas Fury Road, I think, hit that really well. It, it, I didn't. It, it gives. It puts me in a situation. And it gives me a character and a bunch of characters and all these things where it's already been established. There's already been a bunch of movies and whatnot, but I can watch it and enjoy it and not necessarily be confused. I don't necessarily, I'm not saying it has to be like a confusing story or anything. But I think you could easily set up like the events of what happened in the Prime series pretty quickly in like a scene or two at the beginning of this movie and then move on from there. You know, I don't think it, it, the I don't think the investment for a new person or a, a, a someone who isn't like informed or, or a fan or whatever is not that high. Metroid is not that complex. It's not that like in depth really at the end of the day compared to a lot of other sci-fi properties. It's you know the the concepts that are at play are not that difficult to really explain. I really do think that you could come into it with a bit of leniency in terms of like what you're showing from the original source material and not lose a ton of people. I mean, if you present it in a certain way on commercials, like they're going to go and watch it and then if you talk to them about Metroid's a little bit, I mean, they're already in the theaters, you know. So I don't know. I think there you can definitely um, kind of go at it with a like this is like a part of a larger story, whereas it's instead of it being like a movie that's kind of like a summary or an ease into the franchise. Because to be honest, every time I, I see a movie that does that, I feel like it doesn't go well. You know, <laughs> like I feel like at least in my experience, I feel like I see a lot of movies where it's a uh, the adaptation's kind of this softened retelling, accessible version of the main source material and then the movie doesn't do well or it doesn't go lead anywhere and it then end up being good so i don't know why we'd keep trying that at least in my perspective i don't know i i, I bring up castlevania as a good example of what um that movie like that could achieve where like you kind of you you make it a general movie for an audience to like introduce everybody but you also have your source material mm -hmm. i know this for a fact I would watch both of these movies. Oh well, that's a, that's a, that's the thing. I would watch both of these movies for sure. Easy. So there it is. Those are our pitches for Metroid movies. Um, we could go on and on and on. I actually, I th I want to revisit this maybe at some point too when we get some ideas for um, like feedback and whatever. We want to hear your feedback. What you think your your awesome Metroid movie would be? Give us your elevator pitch. Hit us up over on Twitter. Uh, I'm really like. I'm, I'm fired up because there's so many different ways that you could go and like they're all like they all have their merits so like I think that it's a, it's such an interesting topic and one that we can definitely revisit in the future especially as more and more of these video game movies kind of come out and they you know we see different different styles of movies and stuff like that so I, I really want to I really want to know what you guys think hit us up on Twitter let us know we are at Omega Metroid pod um, deck I think that's going to do it for us. This is by far our longest episode, but man, it felt, it felt really good to just sit down and talk Metroid, um, with everything going on. It's like, this is cathartic. It's awesome. Yeah, man. It was great to get lost in, uh, talking Metroid for an hour. And I, and also you put me on the spot there cause I, and now I've now realized that I really need to think more about what I really would want out of a Metroid movie or TV series. Like more specifically, you had a more specific pitch, which I wasn't expecting. And, and it put me on the spot a little bit. Mine was a little more macro and not necessarily honed down. So I hope we do get back to this topic because the next time we talk about it, I'm definitely going to be ready for, I'm going to have a whole script ready. I'm going to have a whole <laughs> script. We're going to bring in a bunch of people and we're going to do a whole table read of our Metroid movies and it's going to be sick. So I'm looking forward to the next time we talk about this topic. Maybe we could do like our top 10 Metroid movie pitches that we get from people and then we'll we'll take DAC Productions and we'll assign X amount of money to each pitch. I think we're on to something here. That's a short film series right there, man. I'm about it. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us for this week. Uh, again, we're going to be doing this uh, weekly from here on now, so uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, no change really for you guys, but... Um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna help us out, and we're gonna have fun recording these shows every week. Um, thank you to everyone that has downloaded and supported and tweeted and retweeted the show so far. We really appreciate it. That's gonna do it for us. Again, on Twitter, you can check out the podcast at Omega Metroid Pod. I am at Spateri three sixteen. Dak is at the Rapture underscore. Uh, make sure that you check us out over on Podbean, on iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, like and subscribe. Tell a Metroid fan in your life that uh, 
you know, finally we got a place where we can get weekly Metroid news, hot takes, and everything in between. Uh, we have a lot of really fun topics lined up, so make sure that you uh, spread the good word about the Omega Metroid podcast. Um, that's going to do it for us for this week. Thank you for listening, guys. And until next time, stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. 